survivors hold positions. Some are violent, some are victims. Each alive is an equal and vital piston by support. So when the piranhas on in New York, my daddy long legs dangled and mangled for sport. And while I bring in every dink in the kingdom with open wings, it all boils down to them shit-soaked pigs. The pigs, the pigs, the dregs of what y'all aim for. The gluttonous muddy stomachs under the pudgy cake hole. Track Brainiac is using the food and payroll that chew up and consume every cookie crumb and peso. Place a cloven hoof on the lucrative one convenient. As the bourbon odor smoker's coughs smolder off the Cohiba, if Noah had the benefit of hindsight on his ship, he could have snatched two unicorns and left behind. Mother fucking pigs. In his 1985 book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, social critic Neil Postman prefaced or primed his reader with a brief but elegant foreword that served as both a nod to the infamous 1984, the literal year, having just come and gone with no noticeable effect, and a reminder of an older, more elegant prognostication in novel form, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. As that Racist kid from American History X says, there's no point in saying something someone else has already said better. Postman writes, quote, We were keeping our eye on 1984. When the year came and the prophecy didn't, thoughtful Americans sang softly in praise of themselves. The roots of liberal democracy had held. Wherever else the terror had happened, we at least had not been visited by Orwellian nightmares. But we had forgotten that alongside Orwell's dark vision, there was another, slightly older, slightly less well-known, equally chilling. Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Contrary to common belief even among the educated, Huxley and Orwell did not prophesy the same thing. Orwell warns that we will be overcome by an externally imposed oppression, but in Huxley's vision, no big brother is required to deprive people of their autonomy, maturity, and history. As he saw it, people will come to love their oppression to adore the technologies that undo their capacities to think. What Orwell feared were those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was that there would be no reason to ban a book, for there would be no one who wanted to read one. Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared those who would give us so much that we would be reduced to passivity and egoism. Orwell feared that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Orwell feared we would become a captive culture. Huxley feared we would become a trivial culture, preoccupied with some equivalent of the feelies, the orgy-porgy, and the centrifugal bumble puppy. As Huxley remarked in Brave New World Revisited, the civil libertarians and rationalists who are ever on the alert to oppose tyranny failed to take into account man's almost infinite appetite for distractions. In 1984, Huxley added, people are controlled by inflicting pain. In Brave New World, they are controlled by inflicting pleasure. In short, Orwell feared that what we hate will ruin us. Huxley feared that what we love will ruin us. This book is about the possibility that Huxley, not Orwell, was right. And maybe he was. Maybe they both were. But what gets lost in this false dichotomy, Brave New World in 1984, is that these two books concern themselves with the way the world will end under the assumption that it's ending. That it's ending is inevitable. Which excludes the far worse possibility, the fallacy of the excluded middle, that the world will not end, but continue on forever as ordinary. This is not a simple concept, it is not safe to think about, and I mean not to casually read and cast aside, but to sit down and think about it for 20 minutes instead of one, 20 hours, 20 days, 20 years. If you stare into that infinity, you will either laugh and end it, or cry and end it, alone on the highest mountain and end it, alone in the deepest sea, end it. 
All of these great minds and many more, you know the players, you know the stage, and these are great minds, the best players we've ever seen. They forgot about the stage. It is part of the story, it is the canvas of the very performance, it is the pages of the book without which there can be no story if you put it under a microscope like an autistic Isaac Newton motherfucker. We haven't done that yet, there is a huge science here. If we put the page under a microscope, we see it is not a clean white sheet, but a miserable tangle of strips of dead organisms and the chemical ashes of the tools that bind their bones together, pressed into shape by heat and pressure and time. Like Newton, we stand on the shoulders of giants, and like Newton, those giants are dead. The capital T truth isn't good or bad, it isn't male or female. The truth is the truth. To say so is not nonsense. It's survival. As with everything before, this is not a new idea. In fact, like everything before, it is a very old one. It would make sense that the first and thus cleanest idea of where we live would come from the first we to think about it. And the first written idea would come from the first we to invent writing, assuming that writing were preserved, but that's part of this story too. And the most elegant written idea would be at this confluence in a time when ideas were pursued to exalt God, the truth, and not exalt ego, or control, or greed. When you strip away these weaknesses, how would you see the world as an alien scientist watching us right now? What do you see? The same thing Publius Porcus saw in 1530 when he wrote the epic and wildly popular Latin poem Pugna Porcorum. He saw the ordinary world, the pig war. Yes, you are understanding this correctly. Me magic is back on the menu. Porcorum was the product of what we call the Renaissance. You know that in 1492 Columbus sailed the ocean blue, but less understood is that this was a period of discovery of many new worlds, or more accurately, a period of rising awareness of the ordinary world in which we exist. This was a crisis of identity, in which every type of intelligent person you can imagine pulled the 37-year-old noticer meme face, stopped and asked, what is the problem? There were religious revolutions, 1517, Martin Luther posts his 95 theses, and scientific revolutions, 1543, Copernicus published a book literally titled Revolutions, moving the sun to the center of the universe rather than the earth, the heliocentric model, which pissed off Martin Luther, and 1592, Galileo changes universities and starts pissing off the people who are pissed off at Martin Luther, while culminating in Francis Bacon, oh hey there again, meme magic, King Pig, not an insult, straight up deucing out the scientific method, Brahe and Kepler taking it to the stars like Elon, Shakespeare wrote some words, Don Quixote wrote a donkey, John Calvin went to work hard, and Thomas Hobbes joined him with some tuna sandwiches and Leviathan, Spinoza, Locke, Thomas More's Utopia, Descartes had a thought, it was Descartes, point being, Everywhere efflorescent a new zeitgeist, a novum organum, as Bacon put it, new organon, which is an Aristotelian term of art meaning means of reasoning or system of logic, which by no accident looks very similar to the word organ. Bacon outlines the scientific method and in so doing accidentally reveals that some humans in this time have grown and are using a new sensory organ and a new kind of sensory organ, an abstract one that is inside you, in interiore, homine papitat veritas, the truth lives inside man. Bacon came to this method in 1620, Pugna Porcorum, the pig war, like all great art, preceded the formal science by nearly 100 years. 1530. A Flemish Dominican friar named John Placentius, writing under the pseudonym Publius Porcus, publishes a 248-line epic poem called Pugna Porcorum, Latin for the Pig War, written entirely in Latin and with every single word of the poem, including the title, epigraph, and author's name, if you notice, starting with the letter P. 
There's actually a modern analog for this if you've ever watched the show Entourage and remembered the subplot with the rapper Saigon. So basically this, with the best technology available in 1530, but with a lot better wordplay, in f***ing Latin. John Placentius, VIP, VOG. Quote, The poem consists of 248 dactylic hexameters, every single word of them beginning with the letter P. As such, the poem is a tautogram. The poem is a satirical epic telling of an intergenerational conflict between the corrupt hogs, porci in Latin, who are hogging all the privileges, and the piglets, porcelli, who want in on them. Their conflict devolves into an open war, and the poet uses pigs to allegorize human corruption, conflict, and revolutionary violence in a simple and transparent way. It is very likely, though not known for certain, that Eric Blair, better known as George Orwell, was aware of this poem when he wrote the 1945 novella-slash-beast fable Animal Farm, which saves a lot of Latin because PP ain't translated all that great. Animal Farm is close enough to communicate the point. Quote, Animal Farm is the story of a group of anthropomorphic farm animals who rebel against their human farmer, hoping to create a society where the animals can be equal, free, and happy. Ultimately, the rebellion is betrayed, and under the dictatorship of a pig named Napoleon, the farm ends up in a state as bad as it was before. You get the idea? Young pig poor, old pig rich. But do you get the idea? As Wei Wu would say, We are a pig. And I might here argue that it is no accident that the national animal of Ukraine is a pig. You live in two worlds. One is the physical, the literal, the spherical rock or flat earth. It actually doesn't matter, not in 2024. In 2024, these are distractions. Perhaps if 2016 was your 1492, you found a new world with new people who wear weird f***ing clothes and shit. 2024 is your 1620, when after eight years of honing your method, you lurked more, if you will. A new pattern has presented itself to you, only because you looked as hard as you could, as long as you could look, and didn't quit. And one day, without any real defining line for quote unquote no reason at all, you see it. The Brave New World, 1984, both, neither, at the same time, the pig war, the ordinary world. The first half of the journey is not only uphill, but also down. Not only an exploration without, but also a descent within. Infinite regress. But there is a difference between knowing the path and walking the path, which leads us to right now, step two of the monomyth, the call. Point of parliamentary procedure. If you want to survive on an animal farm, you need to build an animal house. Ladies and gentlemen, and yes, I just assumed your genders, I'll be brief. The issue here is not whether we broke a few rules or took a few liberties with our kind of female party guests. We did. But you can't hold a whole ideology responsible for the behavior of a few sick, perverted individuals. For if you do, then shouldn't we blame the whole political system? And if the whole political system is guilty, then isn't this an indictment of our government institutions in general? I put it to you, Greg. Isn't this an indictment of our entire American society? Well, you can do what you want to us, but we're not going to sit here and listen to you badmouth the United States of America. Gentlemen, stand. American fun.